All right. Now back with me is one of the top PGA professionals in our business and a member of the board of directors in the New Jersey section. And that is John Mascari. John is also the director of golf at Alpine Country Club in Alpine, New Jersey. He is also a member of Callaway's master staff, and he's been named a top 50 master teacher by U.S. Kids Golf. He co-hosts the On the Tee show on ESPN Radio up in New York, and it's always great having him back with me again this week on Next On the Tee. Hey, Cus, how are you, my friend? I'm fantastic, Chris. How are you? <laughs> I'm really good, thank you. It was great getting to see you for a few minutes at the PGA Merchandise Show. What would you think of what you saw down there? It was great to see you, too. Uh, I thought it was very good. I was very impressed, you know. Um, coming from the last few years, I think we're getting back to some pre-COVID levels. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of turnout. I mean, some of the bigger companies weren't there still, but it doesn't make it a bad show. I got a lot of great info and, and some good tidbits, and I bought a lot of stuff, too. John, you are always the best-dressed man in any room. You are a fashion-forward kind of guy. Where's that fashion sense come from for you? Oh, uh, you know, we always dressed up on Staten Island, where I'm from, so <laughs> it's always that. No, you know, I, Chris, for me, it was being around golf and, and being involved in the purchasing and golf shops. When I was an assistant, I just got to see a lot of styles. I got to learn about clothing, and I, I was able to take some ch chances and risks because I would get free clothes from here or there, and I kind of developed my own personal style. But I think always we should you should dress how you feel, and if, if you feel good, you look good, and that kind of shines when you're walking around, I guess. So I guess so I was looking somewhat decent, so... <laughs> <laughs> So what's your stance on the whole hoodies, joggers, all the non-traditional clothing items that we're seeing guys wear out on tour and on golf courses nowadays? Yeah, I love it. I think it's great. Anything that really uh, print, that's fun, that's comfortable, that makes the game more relatable, maybe I would say, uh, is, is good for me. I don't disrespect the guys who are traditionalists and, you know, button that top button and wear a cardigan or, or, you know, always will wear long pants. But if there's people on the golf course in a, a hoodie sweatshirt or a pair of shorts and uh, sneakers, as long as they're enjoying the game, respecting the game, and uh, being out there and enjoying it with friends, that's, that's good enough for me. All right, so you brought up the word shorts. And one of the things that we're seeing the guys over on Live Golf do as they get to play in shorts. And I was talking to one of your PGA professional peers, and and that person says he couldn't watch last week's live golf tournament for more than a few minutes, even though it was the only live golf that we had on TV on Sunday. He didn't like it because guys looked unprofessional out there playing in shorts. What's your thoughts on PGA Tour players or live golf players oh, getting to man. play in shorts? This, is, this question has been like, pulled apart, twisted, mixed up, asked again at the PGA level for a few years now. And, you know, it kind of all started with the, the pros playing in shorts in their practice rounds. And, you know, I, I really don't have that much of a problem with it. I've kind of softened in the last few years. We were talking two or three years ago, you know, I'd be banging my shoe on the table like Khrushchev saying that we had to have pants on, but, you know, again, I think it's if, – if that's the reason you're not watching golf because of the guys wearing shorts, you might probably not watch golf. As, you're probably a very casual fan. I really couldn't care less. I really don't think it's a big deal. So speaking of Liv, what's your take on where, where we're seeing things go at the tour level nowadays? Everything sort of feels money-focused right now. you got – a billion and a half here, a billion and a half there, four billion in another place. Guys making millions, <laughs> you know, on now on the PGA Tour and getting millions to go over on the Live Tour. We got twenty million dollar purses. It's just it's money, 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 money. How how do you feel about all of that? And has it impacted your desire to watch professional golf on TV? It, it certainly is about money. I just try to figure out how I can get some of it. That's all. <laughs> 
Uh, there seems to be money. I don't know where. You, I mean, listen, I know where the money's coming from, but it seems like every time I open up a website, you know, just check it up on golf, it's to your point, three billion here, four billion here, this uh, billion with a B. Um, it, you know, it doesn't really affect how I watch the game. I think I'm probably not the best person to ask because I'm finding golf wherever it's on TV. I'm looking for it. Um, if, I, if we talk to maybe the casual fan, he might be tempted to swing one way or the other. Um, I'm curious to see how Liv does this year after having another season under his belt. Uh, obviously with some more heavy hitters like uh, John Rahm, that should help. I think their viewership is up. Um, I think it was up this past weekend, but you also have to remember that it was a ring shortened event on the tour. That probably may have had something to do with it as well. But I think, I think they need to get a little more exposure on a streaming service or something like that to really start to move the needle. John, Rory has done a 180 on Live Golf. He hated Live, wanted it to go away a year ago. Now he's saying, well, maybe I was a little too hasty on that. He's also backtrack on guys being able to come back and play on the PGA Tour if they want. And he sort of admonished Jordan Spieth over the weekend, saying the PGA Tour no longer needs the PIF. Then he removed himself from a group text. What, what What's your take on Rory's about face? Yeah, boy, Rory was really the flag bearer for a while, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, you know, it's. I think Rory wants to beat against the best players. Simple as that. I think a diminished PGA Tour and the diminished live tour is kind of bad for both. I think that he quoted something along those lines. I think he wants to play with the best, and if he's starting, I think he's realizing that money is not an object for the live guys, right? They, the, the pockets are so deep. They're just going to keep on picking guys off and picking off the best players. So why not all come together? Let's figure it out. Let's have a great worldwide tour. That's where I think he's at now because I, I believe personally he wants to compete and play against the best of the best. So let's take that a I step can't further, get in between John. his ears, but I think that's where he's thinking. Yeah. You, you know, he wants a great worldwide okay. tour. Well, the PGA Tour isn't worldwide, right? We don't, we don't have events played in Australia. We don't have a I – mean, there's a PGA Tour. There's a PGA uh, sponsor, if you will, or partnership down in Australia and other parts of the world. And the DP World Tour, obviously, there's a tie-in there and could even get stronger. But do you see – like, if you looked in a crystal ball five, ten years down the road, is it a PGA Tour, the PGA itself, the PGA Tour itself, is there – are, are they playing – events throughout the year in different parts of the country or different parts of the world. How do you think this whole thing kind of resolves itself to get the best players back together in a worldwide kind of format? 100% playing worldwide. There's no doubt in my mind. Look at the LPGA tour. Have they have a huge showing on the Asian continent? The NFL is going to have a team in London, Chris. It's going to happen, right? Right. The NHL plays games in Sweden and Finland, and they're regular season games. They're expanding the scope. The Yankees are playing in Mexico this coming year. Right? Yeah. Think about that. It's, it's a smaller world, and I use that term with air quotes. It's a smaller world. Getting these sports out to the masses, to people that may have never been able to see the sport – only grows it, right? It's it's going to become global. So to that to that end, right? If it's gonna become global and we're gonna start playing the PGA tour in other countries, I mean you can't play 40, 50 weeks a year. Some of the events here on the PGA tour are gonna to have to do something else. Right? They're gonna get replaced by something else. How do you think that plays out here? Do you think that maybe what gets played mostly here outside of, you know, five or ten events, and then you go play worldwide, do, does the Corn Ferry Tour expand? Do we get like a sort of a Corn Ferry thing mostly here in the U.S.? Do we get a DP thing over in Europe? And all of that sort of feeds up, because Rory has talked about how Major Major League Soccer or uh, the uh, European Soccer League, you've got sort of the best of the best, and then others get relegated. 
Do you think that that's how it works? We get a, yes. a, a U.S. thing, a DP thing, and then it goes up to the world tour? Yeah, I might. I can kind of envision something like that. I can also envision maybe some of the, I hate to use the word, more fringe PGA Tour events tend to become their corn fairy events. I think you have some of the real big ones on tour will stay. But this is a great opportunity for other parts of the world to showcase golf. I mean, you know as well as I do that there is some unbelievable golf all around this globe. And we saw it at the Ryder Cup in Rome. We, you know, that we see it in uh, Dubai. We see it in Australia. We see it in Asia. Tremendous, tremendous golf. And there's so many more places that could be touched by the game that maybe would never have that opportunity before. So I think it's positive in that matter. But maybe some of the smaller events that we see are here in the United States on our – our current PGA Tour might be relegated to, say, a Corn Ferry event, so on and so forth. Don, let's switch gears a little bit. And I want to go back looking over the course of your career to this point. What's the best advice someone has given you along the way that made a positive impact on your career? Golf-wise or just in general? In general. <laughs> in general, man. Um so I was always taught to never lose sight of your goals, right? So you could put them on the back burner for a little bit, but never lose sight of them. And and my dad taught me that. And even it's not like the popular thing. So as a kid growing up, golf wasn't really popular. You know, I grew up in New York. It was wasn't the popular sport. It was for old men with you know ugly pants. <laughs> but I like to play golf, and I wanted to be a professional golfer, and I wanted to play in college. And that was my goal, and that was my dream. And it wasn't popular, but I wanted it. And that was important to me moving forward because, you know, there's other things in my life that I wanted or there's goals that I wanted to, you know, reach for myself. And really having the belief in myself to do that, writing them down, looking at them, making them real – was always some great advice I got from my dad and from my family as far as don't worry about what you want, figure out how to do it. We'll support you, but you know, don't brush aside your goals because of what someone says or what, what someone does. All right, so let's put a golf twist on that a little bit. What's the best piece of advice or tip that someone gave you concerning your golf game that made a difference? Whoa, that's like an even harder question. I've gotten so many tips. My swing is so bad now. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. You know, I, I, always, I look back on an interaction I had, and I've, I've thought about this a lot, actually. When I was, I was an assistant pro at Hamilton Farm, a great club in New Jersey, and I was so lucky to be part of an amazing staff, which included Mike Adams as our director of instruction. And we had this poll – it was about 150 yards out on the driving range. And it was a slow day, so I was out there kind of working on my game, hitting shots. And I'm trying to turn the ball right to left around the pole. That was my goal. I want to hit a draw. I want to hit the seven iron around the pole. Great. And, I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm swinging halfway back. I'm looking at how my hands are. I'm kind of checking the path. And the ball is just either it's, it's fading or it's, it's not drawing. So I'm getting more and more frustrated I'm switching my feet. I'm putting alignment sticks down. And I'm the only one on the range. And Mike will come over to me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you see that pole? I'm trying to take the seven iron out at that tree and then just have it draw around the pole. He's like, what's all this stuff on the ground? <laughs> I'm like, well, I figure I want to make sure my alignment's right. I'm checking my shoulders. You know, I want to get this wrist in that position there. He's like, get rid of all of it. Come here. And he moved me down like two more stations. And he's like, hit this ball around the around the pole. I'm like, what? He's like, step up there and hit it around the pole. And sure enough, I get up there and boom, I hit it around the pole. He's like, all right, good. How'd that feel? I'm like, nothing really didn't feel anything. Right, he's like, all right, do it again. I do it again. And Mike says, stop being so damn technical and worrying about where your hand is and where your shoulder is and where your head is, boop and a bop, hit the damn ball around the pole. You're a field <laughs> golfer. You can maneuver the face. You can manipulate the ball. Stop trying to be a robot and be an athlete. And 
you know, I, it was kind of an aha moment for me because it was, I was getting so caught up in looking and the swing, looking a certain way and being in a certain position where who cares as long as the product is there. And I wow. think that's great advice for a lot of golfers out there. Stop trying to repeat the swing you see on TV. Stop trying to, you know, you flip through magazines and they, they still have all the frame by frame shots or the great pictures now. You know, our bodies are different. Our, our muscles work differently. Some of us have more flexibility. Some of us has less. Build a swing that's fit for you and hit good shots. And, and Chris, I can tell you that there's been days when I've been on the range before a tournament and I'm hitting a fade. And as hard as I try to hit a draw, I'm hitting a fade. And that's what I'm playing today. I'm playing <laughs> a fade because that's just how it is. And, you know, you kind of have to embrace that feeling of, I'm just going to get out there, I'm going to hit the ball around, do what I can, and not get locked down so much with the technicality stuff. That's great for, you know, we're working on something new, or we're, we're in a simulator, or we're, we're trying to figure out what we can change. But during the course of a round, like when you're getting out to play, man, a good practice swing, envision your shot, and hit it. That is great advice. Good for you, good for Mike. For John Mike, speaking, right? I mean, he's not only like the best teacher on the planet, right? <laughs> speaking of goals for your career, now I've listened to your show that you do alongside of Anita Marks, and I've said, you know what, this guy belongs on TV. You could bring so much to a TV tele uh, telecast. You're a, a PGA professional. You understand Thank what you. it takes to play in big events. You understand the rules of the game. You've also got the perfect personality for it. I know it's something you've batted around a little bit. How do we make this happen? Well, yeah, I've, I've certainly given up on the modeling career, Chris. That uh, <laughs> hasn't worked out too well for me. So <laughs> I figured I'd go the golf route on TV. And my mom always said I had a face for radio, so that worked out all right. But, yeah, you know, it's something I've always dreamt about. You know, it goes back to that, that comment I made before about having some goals and having some dreams for yourself. And I'm 46 years old. It's it's never too late to have a new dream or a new goal. And that's something I really want to explore. Um, doing the show on ESPN has really given me the opportunity to grow in that field and, and feel comfortable talking about the game and expressing myself. And, you know, as a PGA member, as you mentioned, we're, we're kind of asked to do a lot of different things, as you know, whether, like we said, uh, talking about the game, the, we know about the golf course, we know about the swing rulings, decisions players make, hit a certain shot uh it's a sport as you know with a lot of subtle intricacies that may not be evident really to the naked eye but i think i have a keen eye for that and i'd, and I'd love to eventually go down that road with a little bit of humor and uh and explore that area so it's something i've kind of been working on this this winter i've spoke to some uh important people and it's the ball is certainly rolling it's not rolling what? back like the golf ball on tour, but it's rolling forward <laughs> for me. That's great. I know my aunt always said to me, it's it's never too late to be what you always should have been. And I think that that's certainly the case right. for you because I think that's where you belong as well. John, one of the other pieces of major news that uh, has happened this fall, you talk about the, the, the ball roll back. As you know, being on Callaway's staff, the new AI smoke and the trampoline effect off the face of that club increases oh, ball speed and it increases distance. I mean, by the time we get to 2027 for the tour players and 2030 for the rest of us, I mean, the ball's going to be going 10 or 15 yards further than it does now. To me, this whole rollback thing to me is much to do about nothing because by the time we get to 27, I mean, we're going to be hitting it further anyway. You roll it back 5%. We're just going to be right back where we started. It just doesn't make any sense to me, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on the first part of your statement there. The AI smoke driver is unbelievable. And, you know, I'm a Callaway member, but I'm just saying this as, you know, John, the golf pro here. I played three rounds in Florida before, the, before I saw you at the golf show. This driver is crazy. So good. I, and, and I had a lot of rust on my swing, and you know, a little off the heel, a little off the toe. Nothing changed. Wow! Like I was, I was passing it around to God. I'm like, here, try this. You guys are gonna try this. Flagging people down from other groups. You over there in the blue <laughs> shirt, try this. It's such a good driver. I, 
insane. But, yes, the, the ball roll back to your point. We're going to be hitting it longer, right? Um, just wish they didn't touch it for the amateurs. You were for bifurcation? You, know I mean? like, you want to let the pros – yes. Let the pros play a rollback ball. But for my amateur players at Alpine, for amateurs playing against other amateurs, stop. <laughs> you know, we're – PJ members, we're growing the game, we're doing fun stuff to get people into the sport. We want them to hit it long. We want the ball to stay up in the air. We want ladies and young people to hit it higher and longer. Net, we're pulling it back. Pulling it back. It's like having a metal bat in Little League and a wooden bat in the pros. There you go. Okay, so have fun. Enjoy it. Who knows? Maybe, maybe I'll convince the USGA. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I should have been a lawyer instead of a golf commentator. <laughs> Indeed. As you've made mention, and I, I said in your intro, you're now the director of golf at Alpine Country Club in Alpine, New Jersey. For those who are unfamiliar with the club, talk about what you have available there. Well, we have an unbelievable 1928 filling house design. I mean, that is the gem of our club. It is gorgeous. The greens are fantastic. Ryan Ponwitz, who's our superintendent, does an unbelievable job maintaining the place. Uh, greens are at 13-plus seven days a week. Wow. Uh, we're excited to be doing a bunker, bunker renovation project this uh, fall, so looking forward to that. It's only going to put more polish on our golf course. Uh, fantastic facilities. My opinion, the best chef in the country club business, Alex Lee, who's uh, he came from Danielle in the city, you know, Michelin starred, uh, accomplished chef, iron chef. He's been on everything. And then you throw in, uh, probably in my opinion, one of the top 20 teachers in the country, Jonathan Yarwood. He was just ranked the number one teacher in New Jersey. He's a uh, constant on the top 50 and the top 100 instructor list. So, you know, it's a pretty all-star team. The members are fantastic. They utilize the club. They love playing golf. Our rounds are up. Lessons are up. It's just a fun place to work because everyone's so pro-golf. You know what I mean? I mean, we have tennis and pickle and the pool and this and that, but selfishly, it's like, all right, we're all here to golf. Let's go. So that's, that makes it fun every day coming to work, you know, interacting with the members getting them excited to play the golf course, hearing about them four putting all over the place on the green. <laughs> <that I buy. laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm super excited to start my seventh season there this year. I was at the club today. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of green here and there. So uh, we're, we're, we're almost there. It's about 37 right now. Uh, we're supposed to get a little bit of a warm spell this weekend. So maybe that'll, uh, Maybe the, maybe the groundhog is right. Is he ever right? <laughs> hey, you got that going for you, which is nice. Which John, is you nice. mentioned your own show that you do along with Anita Marks there on ESPN Radio in New York. It's called On the T. Talk about your show and how our listeners can find it and tune in. Yeah, it's uh, we're going into our seventh season. Um, myself with Anita on ESPN Radio New York. 98.7 FM, also available on the ESPN app. So uh, if you're not around the New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia area, you can always find us on the app. Sunday mornings, it's perfect for golf. Um, listen to us as you're driving into the golf course before you're around, talking about everything from live golf to the tour, the LPGA, what's happening uh, in and around golf in the industry. And, you know, I, like I said, I could talk the wheels off the bus. So I'll talk about anything. So it's a fun <laughs> show. It's great. Um, always kick it off Masters weekend. Uh, usually Mike Tirico is one of our first guests, so it's nice to have him on. And uh, we go from there to the end of the season. How can our listeners stay up to date with you, whether it's following you online or it's on social media? Yeah, um, you can check me out on social media. I'm on Instagram and the X platform, both under John Mascari, D-G-A, M-A-S-C-A-R-I, not O-I. 
<laughs> to be confused with my cousin here. Indeed. Yeah, John Mascari PGA on uh, social media. It's got a link to my YouTube page and some other fun stuff. So stop by, check me out, drop me a message. Love to grow our community for sure. Because it's always a lot of fun getting to spend time with you. You always make the segment so much fun for me to be a part of and for our listeners to listen to. I hope we get the privilege of catching up with you again soon. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the honor of being on the show again, Chris. I appreciate it. Good luck, everybody. Play great <laughs> golf this year. Thanks. There you go. Take care, John. All the best to you and the family. That is the great John Mascari, folks, at John Mascari PGA. You heard him. That's where you can find him on the T is the name of the show that he and Anita Marks do up on ESPN Radio in New York. He is just a fantastic individual. Boy, I just love spending time with him and having him as part of this show. And then, like I say, I got to spend uh, a little bit of time with him down at the PGA Merchandise Show. And I mean it sincerely. A finer dressed man you will not find. That guy has got an amazing fashion sense. And then is a great player and obviously a director of golf up at Alpine Country Club doing great things there and uh, with within our game. And I'm again, I, another thing I mean sincerely is it just doesn't get more fun than having John as part of this show or having him as part of a, a telecast. I think he belongs on TV. I think he would make each broadcast a lot of fun to be a part of. And hopefully he gets that goal accomplished very, very soon. All right, now back in next on the tee with me is 2019 Champions Tour Player of the Year, Scott McCarron. Let me remind you quickly about Scott's background. He's from Sacramento, California, played his college golf at UCLA, where he helped them win the 1988 NCAA National Championship. He graduated with his degree in history. He won three times out on the PGA Tour, 11 more times so far on the PGA Tour Champions. Like I say, in 2019, he won the Charles Schwab Cup plus the Jack Nicklaus Trophy for being the Champions Tour Player of the Year, added the Arnold Palmer Award for being the Money List winner, and it's always a privilege when I get to have him with me here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Scott, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you doing? I'm fantastic, thank you. Good. So, Scott, we've just gotten the Champions Tour season kicked off this past week. You've... Uh, You've uh, gone out there at Wiley and uh, you had a top 30 finish there. How are you feeling? I know you had some physical issues in the past. How are you feeling out there? Actually, Chris, I'm feeling great. Um, ankle is fully healed. Um, my game's good. Looking forward to playing the next couple of weeks. We go to Naples next week and then all the way to Morocco. I'm um, excited for uh, my, my seventh, eighth year now on the PGA Tour Champions and can't wait to get this thing uh, really going. So, Scott, and I was just talking about this with John Mascara. You mentioned you guys are going to Morocco. It feels like with everything that's going on with Live Golf, everything that's going on on the PGA Tour, the infusion of money and all that sort of thing, that we might be edging towards a tour where it's sort of like what Greg Norman always wanted back in the 90s, a world tour, bringing the game to other parts of the world that hasn't seen it before. How do you... What are your thoughts from what you're seeing? Are, are we starting to sort of baby step our way to something like that? You know, I, I think so, Chris. I think it's something that's uh, long overdue. Um, I think the PGA Tour over the years has kind of hurt some of the other tours, Australia, Europe, Asia, where we could have maybe partnered with them and, and done some good things around the world to really grow the game globally. Um, and I think we're headed toward that direction now. I think it'll be a good thing. Now, obviously, if you're a PJ Tour player, you're going to have to travel a lot more. Um, but I think it's good for the golf game in general to to grow this thing globally. And I think that's kind of where we're headed. How do you feel about the structure? How, how, how could you envision something like that working? Because if we're going more global, I mean, the guys aren't going to be playing, you know, 40 weeks out there. So some events here in the States you would think would have to go by the wayside or become more corn fairy tour like, and then on the DP world tour, maybe something like that happens there that now you're replacing those with whether we're going to Morocco or to your point to Australia or South Africa or wherever it might lead us to something is going to have to fall by the wayside. Do, do you feel like this is kind of be, I've heard Rory talk about like a soccer league, right? Like the premier league where you've got, 
the world tour. Then you've got these other tours and guys go up to the world tour, maybe get relegated back down. So all of that sort of structure, how do you think that that all fits together? You know, Chris, I'm on the Champions Tour now. I kind of worry more about what we're doing on the Champions <laughs> Tour and not what they're doing on the PGA Tour or Live. But you're asking me, I think that you could do something where you move them around, you know, a couple, you, three or four events. You go to uh, a Morocco, a South Africa, Australia. Maybe the next year you go to Japan, you go to Singapore. You could move it around every year where you don't have to play let's say 10 or 12 events um, outside the United States, maybe three or four events and you move it around every year to different places because every place you go, it'll be one of the biggest sporting events in that area. Um, so that's one way you could probably make it work. And I, I would say that, you know, you're probably going to see at some point live guys and PGA tour guys playing together again. I mean, we need them. Uh, the live guys that have gone, gone off, they're big stars and, you know, we need the best players in the world to play against each other more often. However, they figure that out. Um, that's what the fans want. That's what TV wants. And that's what the players want. Scott, to your point with all this stuff that's going on and that sort of thing and all the news around who's in and who's out and PIF and SSG and all that sort of stuff. I, there's certainly not a lot of talk about, you know, you guys getting in the middle of any of that, does that bother you that you guys aren't being sort of talked about in, in the grand scheme of things? You're glad that they're leaving you guys alone. No, I honestly, I think uh, the product on the PGA tour champions is fantastic. I mean, the guys that are out there playing are still phenomenal players. These are hall of fame players. And for people that are from 40 to 80, we're the most recognizable names as opposed to these young kids in the PGA tour. I can't tell you how many people I talk to, say, I don't recognize any of the PGA Tour players' names anymore, but I know all of you guys because I grew up with you. So I think the PGA Tour Champions is in a great spot. I um, mean, obviously, we've got uh, Tiger Woods in two years is going to be coming out and playing with us. And he's told myself and he's told a lot of the guys he's going to play um, some on the PGA Tour Champions. Is that seven? Is that ten? I'm not really sure. But every time he plays, it's going to be huge for us. So I think the PGA Tour Champions is in a great position right now to market itself for sponsors. We're not involved in all the other stuff that's going on between the PGA Tour and Live and DP World. Um, we're kind of like an island a little bit, um, but we're a very recognizable island. And we put out a great product. We do a great job in the pro-ams, pro-am pairings parties. Everybody shows up. It's a little more laid back um, and a little more personable than it, than it is on some of those other tours. So let's take that a step further, because to your point, if and when Tiger Woods decides to play a number of events out on the Champions Tour, suddenly that's going to be the highest rated tour on the planet. Everyone's going <laughs> yes. to tune in to what happens yes. on the Champions Tour for those weeks. That really puts a shift on what's going on. I think that's going to turn the whole, all of the tours on their ears. I mean, well, I think that's it will. going to be huge. I mean, It'll be huge. And I, I do believe, like you said, I think if Tiger plays and when he plays, I think we would be, beat every tour in TV ratings that week, um, at least for the you know short term. If Tiger's playing well and competing on uh, the Champions Tour, which I'm sure he will, that uh, we will do very, very well in TV ratings. And I think at that point, you know, we've got to start preparing now for that. I mean, it's two years away. Um, our purses are at an average of 2 million. You know, we probably need to get them up to about 3 million. Um, and we got to make sure that, you know, Tiger is in, incentivized to play. And I think he will be. He, you know, we're all his friends. He grew up playing with us on the PGA Tour. Um, the camaraderie out there is a lot of fun. And, and I really do believe he's going to come out and play. But, but our PGA Tour champions, guys, got to start preparing now for that. And we can't wait till the last minute. Yeah. So what do you think that does to the to the rest? I, I got to believe it when the ratings go through the roof and Tiger plays in a in a U.S. senior open or a, a senior mm -hmm. open championship and the ratings are through the roof. Whoever the tour commissioner is at the time, if it's Jay Monahan, he's pulling his hair out. He's going to we, we put did all this work with whatever happens with live in the PGA Tour and SSG and all of that. And now this week, everybody's watching the Champions Tour. You know, again, we're all part of the same family. So I think that's still okay. And, and hopefully that uh, 
whoever is commissioner at the time will enjoy the fact that the PGO Tour Champions is kind of getting its just due. Uh, these guys are great players, and they deserve it. And I think that uh, Tiger Woods is going to bring a lot more viewers to our tour. And I think uh, as a whole, it just brings the whole product up to another level. Scott, uh, switching gears a little bit, I read a story that you came back to golf after taking some time off early in your career to help your father and the family business. And you did come back after you went to a senior tour event at the time, the Rallies Senior Gold Rush Tournament. You built yourself a longer putter in your garage, which then helped you get excited and to want to go out and play again. Is that story accurate? Is that how it happened? Yeah, it's very accurate. As a matter of fact, yeah, I, I kind of quit golf for about four years after college and uh, saw a bunch of those Champions Tour guys putt with a long putter, uh, made my own. I went and played the tournament uh, a couple weeks later, um, almost, and I won it. And then I uh, went and signed up for the United States Mid-Amateur. I was 25 at the time and made it to the quarterfinals. That's really what kind of got me back into golf. And uh, if it wasn't for seeing the Champions Tour guys playing at my home course at Rancho Marietta, and some of those guys putting a long putter, I would not be playing golf for a living. So uh, I'm very thankful that uh, I saw those guys putting with it. And uh, it's it's been – I've actually putted with a long putter longer than any professional um, alive now uh, playing for the last 30-something years. Scott, speaking of your home course at Rancho Marietta, they dedicated a clock to your father who we lost back in uh, 2022. And earlier that day, you played golf on the North course there. You made a mm -hmm. hole in one had to be an incredibly emotional moment for you. What was that like? Yeah, it really was Chris. And my, uh, my wife and I, and my, my sister and my mom uh, had a clock dedicated to my dad. One of those, you know, those big, huge clocks going on the first tee. And we were going to have the unveiling at two o'clock. So my wife and I, and my son-in-law, Clay Fisher decided to go play nine holes real quick before the unveiling. We had maybe 80 to hundred people coming to the little ceremony. And sure enough, on the sixth hole, I hit this shot. And as soon as I hit it, I said to Clay, I turned to Clay and I said, that's going in. It's like a 200 yard par three. And it took one hop and went right in the hole. And uh, it was just an incredible moment. Very emotional. Um, I kind of put it out on Twitter right after uh, I made that hole in one. And it was, uh, you know, very telling, quite a story. You know, my dad is obviously still watching from above. And uh, to have that happen on that day, my 17th hole in one, and I hadn't had one in a long time, uh, was very, very special. Scott, when you won your first tour event at the Freeport McDermott Classic in New Orleans, you started the final round. You had a one-stroke lead going in over Tom Watson. And I read that Johnny Miller, even though you guys are both California guys, really kind of scoffed at you on the, on the driving range, <laughs> thinking that you were going to win that event, thinking that you thought you could win that event over Tom Watson. How much did that fuel you that day to prove him wrong? Yeah. You know, that's a, uh, that's a great question, Chris. Uh, Johnny and I, I actually grew up at Silverado country club in Napa with Johnny. He was one of my boyhood idols and heroes growing up. And so to be on the driving range and Johnny's announcing and, Johnny kind of said, came over to me and said, Hey, you know, you're in the hunt, but what are you trying to just get out of this? And I said, I looked Johnny right in the eyes. I said, Johnny, I'm here to win. And he kind of laughed. He said, yeah, like whatever. Um, so I was trying to, you know, obviously prove to myself and prove to Johnny that this little snot nosed kid from Silverado that used to follow him around all the time had what it takes to win on the PGA tour. So it definitely fueled me. Um, you know, and Johnny doesn't, didn't really mean anything by it. That's Johnny just being Johnny. And, uh, I, I love him dearly. And, you know, he kind of spurred me on. He, and again, it made me realize that I wasn't here just to get experience. I was here to, I was playing to win and, uh, going up against my, one of my idols, Tom Watson, who's arguably one of the best players to ever play in the wind. And it was one of those days that was blowing 20 to 30 miles an hour. I was certainly had a very uphill task. Um, that day, but I played great and uh, was able to win the, that tournament by five shots and kind of propelled me on, on the PGA tour. And when you got that win, it got you into the 96 masters. And when I look back at that tournament, you finished tied for 10th. You led the field in average driving distance that week at 310 yards. That was the era of the Taylor made burner and the Callaway big Bertha. So I was kind of curious, what did you have in your bag 
back then when you were driving the ball, and that's always been a, a big part of your game and one of your strengths. But when you what you have in your bag then versus what what you're playing now? Yeah, a great story. I w- actually went to New Orleans with no driver. I was looking for a driver, and uh, at the time, Callaway had just came out with the great big Bertha. And so they put one in my hands and the guys in the, the tech shop said, Hey, listen, the sweet spot's not in the middle. It's actually high on the toe. So you got to tee it up really high and try to hit it on the toe. And for whatever reason I did, I, you know, I've always been a guy that kind of hits it low on the heel as a cutter. And that week I was just trying to hit these big sling hooks high on the toe. And I was just absolutely bombing it. And uh, that was the driver I won New Orleans with. And that was the driver I uh, led the Masters with in 96 in driving distance. Uh, you know, that great big Bertha, you look back now, it looks so small. But back then it was <laughs> huge. Uh, and, and now I'm using this this Tour Edge 723C. And I got it last year in Hawaii. And I have just been absolutely bombing it straight. I mean, I think I'm second or third in total driving on our tour. I might be third or fourth in distance. Uh, I just absolutely, I've never found a driver like this Tour Edge 723C in my entire life. Uh, it's its the best driver I've ever hit, and it's the best club in my bag. Scott, you mentioned playing well in the wind a moment ago, and the background image on your Twitter account is the seventh hole at Pebble Beach. And I understand why they had to cut last week's tournament short due to weather, but I kind of wanted to see those guys dealing with the crazy high winds, particularly on that seventh hole. Over the course of your career and the times that you've played out there at Pebble Beach, what's been the range of clubs that you've had to hit on that short par three? Yeah, I, I've had to hit four iron one year. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, pl- I actually played like this little Monday Pro-Am the week right before the uh, AT&T one year, just filling in for a guy. And, and it blew so hard that we got on top of six and – we we're putting up to the, the whole location. The balls would roll all the way back off the green. Wow. And I got to seven and I actually hit four iron on seven and came up short. Wow. And uh, it was just, it, I think I shot 46 on that, the first nine holes. And then I shot like 33 on the back nine to lead this little pro-am with it had like 20 tour pros by like four. <laughs> it was just one of those days <laughs> that was crazy. Scott, back in 2012, almost 12 years ago to the day, as a matter of fact, you were inducted into the California Golf Writers and Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. What was it like being recognized like that back in your home state? You know, that it really was quite an honor. Um, I, I was very surprised because I was still pretty young at the time. <laughs> um, I wasn't, you know, when you think of Hall of Fame, you think of guys that are over the hill and past their prime. Um, so I was, I, I'd gotten the Sacramento golf hall of fame the year before, and then, uh, the California golf writers hall of fame. And I felt like I was just too young at the time, but it was quite an honor. And, um, we had a great night. I told a couple of great stories, um, about playing Cypress point and sneaking on. And, and I used to always play Cypress point, but I always started on two and me and a buddy of mine would, uh, carry one bag and both of us would play two through, uh, 17 and then walk back to the car. So I asked if there was anybody in the audience that were members of Cypher Point, because I'd certainly love to play one and 18 sometime. <laughs> uh, n- no, nobody called me, by the way. <laughs> That's great. Scott, just a couple more before I let you go. And you're also a pilot, and I saw your video doing some aerobatics in a P-51 Mustang. You look like you're ready to join Tom Cruise in Top Gun 3. Talk about some of your favorite flying experiences. Yeah, I've I've been very fortunate. Uh, I got my pilot's license uh, back in 1987, my senior year in college uh, at UCLA. And I used to fly out of Santa Monica Airport there right by the school. And I, I flew quite a bit for a couple of years, let it go for a while. And then I got current again right around 2012 and was flying all over California, a little Cessna 172s. And I just love flying. I've had some great experiences. I got to go up uh, with uh, the Thunderbirds and the F-16 and a three ship. Uh, we filmed for uh, PGA Tour productions inside the PGA Tour. I got to go up in an F-18 and do sorties against an F-16. Um, I've done T-38s. Um, P-51 Mustang, though, is probably one of my favorite planes I've ever been in. And I've done that a few times now. Lee Lauterbach, who owns Stallion 51, and who was Arnold Palmer's chief pilot for 17 years, a very dear friend. 
And so I go down there every once in a while and, and do some flying. And I took a buddy of mine, Dan Hughes, and we went down there and did loops and rolls and Cubans and figure. I mean, we just had so much fun. And uh, I got to fly the whole time and I got to land the P-51 for the first time. So that was kind of cool um, with my, my good buddy, John Boards Possum, who flies for them every once in a while. So I, I enjoy that. It's uh, it's quite a thrill, and it's always been one of my goals is to get my own plane and fly around the Champions Tour. But my wife doesn't like small planes, so that I, I, she either get, wants to get a jet, which I can't afford, or uh, I'm not going to be able to fly around the Champions Tour on my own plane. <laughs> Scott, one more before I let you go, and we all need to get the recipe from you for that rib roast you made right before Christmas and the video you posted out on Twitter. Looked absolutely amazing. How do we do that? Oh, my gosh. You got to go to cowsteaks.com, K-O-W, and get the American Wagyu beef. It is phenomenal. Um, some of the best meat I've ever had. And I, I, it's just amazing. So we've got a great uh, rib roast recipe. If anybody wants to uh, DM me on Twitter, or I'll, I'll kind of share that with you. Um, it, it's just absolutely fantastic. And uh, we're looking forward to doing some more of that uh, down in the Eleuthera Islands because Jenny and I just bought a lot down in the Bahamas at, uh, in North Eleuthera. They're a great place, brand new, called Jack's Bay Club. And you can go to jacksbayclub.com and check it out. Chris, this is the best piece of property I've ever seen for a golf course community in my entire life. And we are so excited to, uh, to be a part of this. Wow. Sounds fantastic. Scott, how can our listeners stay up to date with all the great things you're out there doing? Let them know how they can do it, whether it's uh, online or it's on social media. Yeah, you can go to uh, on X at Scott McCarran or on Instagram at Scott McCarran Golf. Um, follow me there. And uh, if you want to get a good recipe, let me know. And go check out jacksbayclub.com. It's phenomenal. Well, we will be doing both of those things. Scott, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to come back and be a part of the show. You're fantastic, my friend. I hope we get this privilege a little bit later on in the year. Anytime, Chris. You know that. Take care, Scott. All the best to you and Jenny. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. Sounds good. See you, Scott. See you, Chris. That is the great Scott McCarran, folks. Just absolutely one of the great people you get to meet in this life and one of the fantastic players, obviously, in the history of the PGA Tour. Won three times out on the regular tour, 11 more times so far out on the Champions Tour in the 2019 Player of the Year. And uh, you got to go out there and check out that steak, folks. Cowsteaks.com, K-O-W, steaks.com, and the American Wagyu beef. That video that he did, man, I was so jealous. I got to be able to do that come the holidays this year, even just you know on our average Saturday or Sunday. And then uh, I can't wait to look at jacksbayclub.com. It's, if Scott says it's a it's the best piece of property and the best golf course he's ever seen, it's worth going to take a look at. And I look forward to catching up with Scott a little bit later on in the year. All right, now back with me here on Next on the T is a two-time winner on the PGA Tour, and that is Rick Fair. Let me remind you about Rick's background. He is from Seattle, Washington. He won the Greater Seattle Junior Championship three times. In 1979, he won the Washington State Junior title, and he also won the PGA National Junior Championship at Callaway Gardens, which is just a little south of me here in Atlanta. Rick played his college golf at BYU, where he earned his bachelor's degree in finance. He was an All-American in 1982, 83, and 84, and he was named the WAC Conference Player of the Year all three of those seasons. Plus, he helped BYU win the WAC Championship all four years he was there. He is a member of the Cougars National Championship team back in 1981, along with our friend Richard Zockel. Rick won the 1982 Western Amateur. In 1983, he was a member of the Walker Cup team that defeated the Great Britain and Ireland team 13 and a half to 10 and a half. He was also the low amateur in the 1984 Masters and U.S. Open. Turned pro in the fall of 84, and he joined the PGA Tour in 85. Got his first win in 86 at the BC Open. His second win came in 1994 at the Disney World Oldsmobile Classic. Along with his two wins, he finished second nine times and had 41 top tens. In 1999, he was inducted into the BYU Hall of Fame, and I couldn't be more honored. I get to have him back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, Rick, thanks for coming back on the show.
Rick, you're on mute, my friend. Well, how about that? Hey, All right. Hey. Anyway, thanks for having me on, Chris, and uh, thanks for uh, reading that uh, that resume. It reminded me of some good moments. There you go. So, Rick, I hated that I missed you at the PGA Merchandise Show last week. What did you see when you were there that uh, captured your attention? Well, I spent uh, probably 50% of my time in and amongst uh, my peers, so attended the Open Forum, which is the gathering of a lot of a lot of coaches and instructors, and uh, yeah, there's a group of about 13 or more of us that uh, they gathered at Bay Hill, kind of a coaches roundtable. So our good friend David Ogren was part of that, and Rob Strano, and a bunch of coaches. We just so anyway, I spent a lot of time with with my peers. I'm in coaching now, and then and uh, yeah, did spend a little bit of time on the floor. Yeah, and sorry I missed you. So Rick, recently you posted out on Twitter that a consistent and desirable pressure trace is more vital to good ball striking than decent launch monitor numbers. Talk about that and why that's the case. Well, I would say this is that I'd say that um, I'm, <laughs> I may have uh, probably could have chosen better words, but the point I was trying to make is, is that, um, you know, there's a number of different ways to produce, you know, let's say you're somebody striving for the right, you know, a club path, face angle, you know, those kind of things that cause that golf ball to go where we want. Um, but for, uh, uh, there's certain, uh, pressure trace that, or, or pressure traces that the best players in the world have produced. So that's basically, um, you know, it's obviously measuring forces into the ground and, and kind of the, the motion down below. And, uh, so anyway, the, I've just found that, that you can't fake it. You know, people can, can, uh, catch lightning in a bottle, you know, and hit a good shot, but the ones that are obviously striking it more solid and, and have better dispersion and all that stuff. Uh, uh, I think there's a stronger correlation from what we see from, uh, pressure mats and, and, uh, pressure, you know, plates and everything else than, than maybe what launch monitors tell us. Rick, speaking speaking of being in, in a coaching forum and and all the things that you're doing now as a coach, it feels like I mean you can go out on YouTube and, and do a Google search. There's a million different videos and people trying to teach the game. It it feels like a lot of different ways, and you can get so many swing thoughts in your head and all that sort of thing when you watch all of these videos. What's your opinion about where the coaching piece stands right now? It just seems like there's so much information. It's hard to discern what's good information and what's just messing us up. Uh, I agree. Yes. Um, I, I would never question intent. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I feel like all the coaches and the golf instructors that I know and I've interacted with, every, we're all pretty, um, pretty selfless. I think that, that everybody wants to help their clients, their students enjoy and perform better, better on the golf course. Um, Sometimes we're at different stages of learning, uh, meaning uh, whether it be experience or education or just instincts. I think some some coaches might do a better job than others as far as identifying what really matters and what maybe doesn't. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the YouTube and Instagram stuff is probably more preferences rather than absolutes. Um, I'm trying to build build you know, my practice upon, you know, what are the absolutes? I mean, we've seen lots of different positions at, at the top of the golf swing that, that have won major championships and continue to, and, and, you know, different takeaways, you know, like not every great player has that club outside the hands and, you know, the whole thing. So, um, so yet I see an awful lot of people on the, on, on the T line at where I teach, you know, at the driving range, working on stuff that I'm, I, I'm concerned that they don't know why they're working on what they're working on. And so I do my best to, um, again, stay, stay true to the absolutes and what they're physically capable of doing and uh, trying to explain why uh, it may be important to do one thing versus another. Rick, you've also commented on the mental side of the game. I saw you recently talked about being in flow state and how we can need to be careful that, manage our expectations and, and that doesn't get in the way of the narrow focus and the target engagement required 
to be in flow state? How do we handle pre and post show and 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 different things for um, making sure that we aren't you know, again clouding our minds so much and getting in our own way, which stops us from getting into the, kind of that flow state of mind. Yeah. So, um, uh, let's see, you mentioned it, you kind of framed it with pre and post shots. So I think that we want to be in a, in a kind of a mindset where we have a, those of us who are pretty visual, you know, kind of envision the shot, us pulling off the shot and maybe we even see the, the trajectory and the path the ball is going to travel on to end up where we want it. So that would be a, a very clear picture of the outcome we want. And then depending on the skill level, then a, a lot of us may be capable of self-organizing movement around that. Meaning, you know, certainly experienced and elite players um, know what a right to left shot versus a left to right shot may feel like. So I know that's a small percentage of your listeners, but, but we want to work towards that, in my opinion. I think that um, an artist, you know, is kind of just watching the brush or the or the, you know, the pencil travel to create what they want. And I think that golf is not different than that. So, um, so that would be, you know, kind of accessing, you know, a, a portion of our brain that maybe isn't clouded with a bunch of, um, you know, kind of very conscious you know, um, A to B to C type of, of movement patterns, but more of a flow. And so, but when we, when we're fearful of the outcome, right, we enter into kind of the, the beta brainwave activity, which serves us well when a bear comes jumping at us out of the woods, we want, we want adrenaline and we want, you know, that panic response can, can get us to do some good things, but the golf, we want to be more alpha theta brainwave. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that, you know, kind of a, you know, a narrow focus and a clear target and, you know, that sort of thing a lot kind of forces the other stuff out of, you know, maybe the place we don't want to hit it at some point. It's like, no, I'm, I'm sending it in this direction. And so, so there's, there's an awful lot to it. You know, flow state is kind of the common expression. It could have been called the zone and it can be whatever else. And then, um, you know, there's an awful lot of talk now about mindset and detaching ourselves from the outcome, right? So we're pretty self-critical in, in a post-shot environment where, you know, we hit a poor shot and there, most of us go into, well, what was, what did I do wrong in my swing? And, you know, the negative self-talk of I suck and you know, everything else. And so, <laughs> so managing all that is not, not easy, right? And I think all of us struggle with that to some, uh, some extent, but the good news is, is that here in 2024, there's a lot more attention on that, far more um, uh, resources to access and people to access that can help people um, play more freely, perform better, and enjoy the game more. And so it's a big part of it. I, I have commented that, you know, obviously, um, you know, the on-course reporters or the guys in the tower, you um, you know, may comment, oh, you see, you made a bad swing. And, and, you know, the question I would, that I would pose is like, well, but where did that quote unquote bad swing come from? You know, and I think that at that level, I think most often it's like there, you know, was a negative thought or, you know, somebody was not in flow state. And so, um, so anyway, I think it's a very important part of performance and, and should be trained along with a technique. Rick, taking what you just said there a step further, a lot of success in tournament golf has to do with our mental approach and how we are treating ourselves and our brains and being able to deal with pressure. How do you teach your students to deal with pressure that comes with competing in tournaments, particularly if we happen to find ourselves with a narrow lead coming down the stretch? Yeah, my my style would be, you know, certainly to steer people along the path, whether it's a formal program, whether it's, you know, like going through my buddy Rick Sessinghouse's flow code uh, program, or maybe they're learning from, you know, Dr. Raymond Pryor has a great book out now um, and golf beneath the surface and, and has some wonderful practical stuff to, that really applies to our lives in general, not just golf. So there's that formal kind of mindset, uh, the sports psych sort of approach. But then also I feel that, um, for 
for players, especially those who find themselves in a competitive environment. I think there's a technique from a technique standpoint. We want to build something that performs fine when we're not in flow state, meaning, you know, you're scared to death and you can't calm your heart rate and your breathing is not under control and everything else that you still have a way to get it in play or get it on the green or whatever you got to do or make that five footer. So so I come at it from both, both angles because I think that, I think it's aspirational, but I'm not so sure it's realistic that you're going to execute every shot in that flow state. So we want the, the panic shot to be fine and, and, you know, not destroy your round. So something you just mentioned a moment ago, calming the brain, when we have a five footer that we've got to make, because to your point earlier that you made, we tend to project ourselves into, I need to make par here. I need to make this birdie. I've got to do this thing. We, we, we start to be outcome oriented, but how do you calm the brain down when you know it's a pressure putt that you really got to make? Yeah. Again, I hate to say it, that it's, it's multi-pronged, but there are, there are, you know, certainly aspects of, you know, focus, focus, learning to narrow that focus. Like, okay, you can't stop that bad thought that, you know, don't miss this or, you know, you've got to make it. Um, but you can, you can just let that pass by and then just really focus on the line and the field of getting it started on that line. Um, and again, that's training rep, you know, experience, you know, the more times you've done it in competition, hopefully we're, you know, learning how to handle it. Um, but certainly, you know, that whether it be breathing technique, everything else that can help, help create the physical state where you can do it. And then there's the um, kind of framing what it, what it actually is like, you know, just like there's a lot of golfers that throughout the years that have done well because they have balance in their life and, you know, their identity is not in the outcome and, and, and they recognize that the significance of that, there are more important things in the world. And so, so for example, some, some players that may be men or women of faith, sometimes, you know, that's helpful, right. That they know there's, there's a bigger picture than, whether or not you make the cut or, you know, get into the playoff or whatever. So, you know, that's not really a, a mind trick or a cop out, but I think that people who aren't people of faith, you know, they have this access to the same sort of techniques. And I think that, and that's where detaching from outcomes, you know, just get in, um, you know, make a good decision, process things well, execute, and then, you know, move on. So, um, you know, that, it's a, that's a tough one to do, right? Because, um, you know, you've worked a long time, maybe your whole life to get in that situation and then to then say, ah, this isn't that big a deal. <laughs> so, uh, but there's, there's, you know, people are learning to do that. And, um, um, again, like I said, there's such, there's some great, great men and women that are helping coach people how to do that. And it's not, it's not my area of expertise, but, but I do try to integrate that in my coaching. Rick, expanding on the the pressure situation, you were a part of the 1983 Walker Cup team. You also had Nathaniel Crosby, who was the U.S. Amateur Champion at the time. Brad Faxon was also on that team. Talk about playing for your country, because I imagine that the pressure at that point is even amped, even higher, because you've got a shirt that says USA, you got a hat that says USA. Now you're playing for your country. Talk about dealing mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, so. It's obviously an honor, number one. Number two, and I was, um, when I played, we played overseas. So we played at uh, Royal Liverpool over in Hoy Lake. And so you're, when you're out of country, it probably feels different, right? Because you're kind of the, the visitor. And, and at that point, I hadn't played internationally very much. So I think it was a new environment. But but I think that, you know, certainly representing your country um, or, or your continent, uh, you know, sure, when they play, the national anthem at the at the cer opening ceremonies and that sort of thing it, it really hits you but i think in competition really and maybe i never played on a Ryder cup but those guys may feel the same thing it's yeah you're playing for your country but it's really your teammates right so it's like you don't want to let your four ball partner down or 
you know, let your, let your team down. Cause you got to carry your weight and, and, and do, contribute your part. Um, so that's kind of, that's what I have felt typically in a team event. And obviously I haven't played anything uh, really like a Walker cup since, but I played in like, um, we had some, a mixed team tournament every December. I played in that with an LPGA player and, and I played in a few where, you know, I had another PGA tour player as a partner and, you know, you always, cause you, you run the risk, of, you make a mistake. You, you can deal with letting yourself down, but when you let your teammate or your partner down, it carries a little more weight. So that's where I felt a little bit more pressure. Rick, talking about things that feel different every year when the calendar flips to January, most golf fans start looking forward to that year's masters tournament. You were the low amateur in 1984. You played in that event six times. Does it feel different? playing there than it does in every other tournament or do we as golf fans just over romanticize that? No, I think, no, it's different for sure. And you know, I played in the, um, you know, a lot of other major championships and, and they all have that extra thing, but um, you know, there is something absolutely different about Augusta national. And, and I think that, you know, the fact that, Growing up, I, I saw it the same way as, you know, however you put it, the average golf fan. You know, I, you know, when I was 15 years old, I wasn't playing in the Masters. I was watching it like everybody else and watching the drama unfold on those memorable holes and the beautiful, you know, surroundings. So and then all of a sudden, fast forward, there I am, you know, when I'm 19, 20 years old, you know, playing, you know, I've got, you know, I've got a tea time, so to speak. And um, so I think the buildup, and then the actual experience itself um, is unique. And I think that among the courses that I played in major championships, you know, Augusta national, at least back then was, was very unique, right. It was, you know, not deep rough. It was, you know, it, it was a closely mown grass where the ball gets rolling backwards. It trickles back into a, a pond, you know? And so, um, you know, I felt like, um, uh, playing the Masters, I felt like doubles were lurking, and whereas the U.S. Open is just going to bogey you to death, so it was just kind of a kind of a different, different, uh, different event, different course, everything else, and and then of course when when viewers and patrons and everybody else sees it the way they see it, you know that that does project onto the players as well. Rick, just a couple more before I let you go, and. You were the number one ranked putter on tour frequently when you were out there. And putting is such an underpracticed part of most of our games in a place where many of us lose five or six strokes around due to three putts. What are some drills that really helped you become such a great putter? Yeah. Um, so I have my current view based on some things that I've talked to Mark Brody about, but but back, I'd say one thing, and I have my students do it, is, you know, there's all different sort of putting games. I, I'm a fan of if somebody's going to take the time to go actually practice their putting, you know, there's the technical part. If somebody has issues with setup or the putting stroke and that sort of thing, there's, you know, the technical side of things and maybe a training aid might be helpful or whatever else. But then outside of that, I, um, I often growing up, would measure out one putting length and put down a T or a coin, measure out a second put a putter length. And so I basically set down markers at three feet, six feet, nine feet, 12 feet, and 15 feet, and then stepped back to 30 feet. And so I got to the point where I, I the game I played is I need to make 10, 10 in a row from three feet to advance to the second, second coin or T. And then at the second, second spot, I think I, I made myself make either seven or eight out of 10. And if I didn't pull it off, I had to go back to the first and make 10 out of 10 again. Anyway, you work your way through, set a little target on each one. And then um, eventually from 30 feet, I had to make one and two putt all the rest. And so the reason I mentioned that is, is I didn't know it at the time, but whoever introduced me to that that challenge understood that yeah, I'm hitting putts that matter, you know, and I'd even feel a little bit of pressure. It's like, okay, I've made eight in a row. I can't, I've got to make the next two or I got to start all over or whatever. So there was a, each putt that I struck had significance. And so any game that, that, that adds that element, because it's easy to just 
go out on the putting green, grab three balls. Why do we grab three? Because typically they come in a sleeve of three. There's no there's no benefit to put with three balls as opposed to one or seven. But um, but sometimes we, you know, we're out there hitting putts, but is it the most productive use of our time? So there's, you know, there's a number of other putting games, but that's just one that I would mention. And then, you know, Mark Brody, uh, you know, mentions that tour players ought to be just grinding away at three to six foot putts and then leg putts, you know? And so, you know, if somebody needs, has a limited amount of time, you know, train those three to six footers and then hit some longer putts, trying to get it close to the hole and, you know, you should avoid those three putts. Rick, you're the director of instruction now at Aldara Golf Club outside of Seattle. Let our listeners know, how can they come and, and get coached by you, whether it's in person or are you available on some of the apps like V1 to get a, a virtual lesson from? Uh, great question. So so I, I, I switched things up on you, Chris. I'm uh, not at Aldara anymore. I'm now... I was uh, wanted to be more accessible to the general public, so now I'm at a, at a course in the Seattle area named uh, by the name of Golf Club at Newcastle. Um, so I've got my own business going up there. Um, best way to find me is fairgolf.com or Twitter and Instagram. It's at fairgolf. Um, uh, I I'm I'm not doing as much of the online stuff, but if somebody has interest, they can certainly reach out to me. Um, uh, I do that basically via the coach now app. So um, if somebody wants to reach out via email or um, direct message me, we can certainly take a look at swings. I've just moved away from sort of the individual swing analysis stuff. I feel like there's plenty of that out there and in my coaching style, I like to go a little deeper and more in person. So, but certainly, Hey, if there's somebody off there in Delaware that wants to get a, a get, <laughs> wants me to take a look at their, Putting stroke or their swing, you know, they can reach out to me. Rick, you're the best, my friend. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of the show. You're fantastic. What a wonderful instructor you are now. I hope we get the privilege of staying in touch and having you back as part of the show again a little bit later on in the year. Anytime, Chris. Uh, you're the best. I appreciate you. Rick, take care, my friend. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. All right. See you, Rick. Folks, that is the great Rick Fair. And when he says fairgolf.com, it's F-E-H-R. That's the spelling of his last name, fairgolf.com. He mentioned the Coach Now app as well. And a guy that was just a tremendous player when he was out on the PGA Tour and is now transitioned to being one of the best coaches that we have in our game. I can't thank him enough for being a part of the show. I hope we get that privilege, like I say, having him back on the show again real soon. When you want to pick the brain of a guy that is not just a great swing coach, but also a great mental coach and a guy that's been in the grind, again, winning out on the PGA Tour, being a part of a national championship team in college and then playing uh, in, in some of the you know great amateur events like the Walker Cup team, it just doesn't get better than Rick Fair. And like I say, hopefully we get the privilege of catching up with him again before too long. All right, now back and next on the tee with me is another one of the great instructors in our game, a guy that has been fantastic for many years now, and that is Todd, uh, Todd Kolb. Todd played his college golf at UNLV and then at New Mexico State. He was named first team All Big West back in 1993. Later that year, he also became a member of the PGA of America, again, become one of the, one of the best instructors in our game. He opened the Todd Kolb Academy at Willow Run Golf Course in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, back in 2000. Golf Digest has named him the 2022-2023 top instructor in the state of South Dakota. Previously, he was the 2008 Minnesota Teacher of the Year. And that year, he finished tied for fourth, though, by the way, in the Minnesota PGA Professional Championship. He was the 2010 and 2014 Dakota Chapter Teacher of the Year. In 2010, he was also the medalist for the U.S. Open local qualifying. You've probably seen Todd's instructional videos out on U.S. Golf TV, YouTube, or on his own site, ToddColbGolf.com. He's written a wonderful instructional book titled The Bad Lie, Why Traditional Golf Instruction is Failing You and What to Do Instead. You can go find that out on Amazon.com, and I'm delighted I get to have him with me tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, Todd, how are you, my friend? Good, Chris. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Todd, I got to ask you, did you make it down to the PGA merchandise show this year? 
you know what we did actually um it's always a fun week to get together and see some uh, you know see a lot of old friends that you only get to see once a year and of, of course kind of wander the floor and see what else is out there and kind of new um uh, but yeah we made it down the it um i felt like the participation was higher than normal and then i've seen it in a couple of years past which speaks of course to the you know the growth of the game and um it's always a fun week speaking of seeing something new did you see something down there that really captured your attention well, you know what? Yeah, a couple things. One of the things that was, I mean, there's always some new training aids and some different things and some some remakes of old ideas, which is which is always kind of fun to see. But the, in my opinion, there was definitely uh, a move towards. Uh, you can see the the simulation of golf or golf simulators or indoor golf, whatever you want to call that. You can see that part of the industry really starting to take off. I mean, the advancements that have been made in in home uh, golf simulators over the last five or six, seven years has been tremendous. So, you know, with the technology behind that, um, it's pretty impressive. That was kind of, I guess, the one thing that stood out to me. Todd, one of the themes of tonight's show has been discerning between good golf tips and those that really aren't going to help us much, which kind of fits in line with your book, Why Traditional Golf Instruction is Failing You. Talk about why that is. Why Why is golf instruction out there designed more for top level players, not average golfers like me. Well, it's a great question. It's it's something that that I've become real passionate about. Um, I you know as you go through your coaching career and you learn different things and and your ideas and and philosophies and beliefs kind of evolve and change. You know, the vast majority of the stuff that we see in I, I don't like necessarily the word traditional, but in in general, like coaching that we see on in magazines and on TVs, of course, is geared around the best players in the world. I mean, because those are the people who are um, in the highlights and winning the tournaments at that time. And so the natural comparison is, hey, if this uh, man or woman is doing this and winning on the LPGA or the PGA Tour, and that's what they're doing, then maybe that's what everybody should be doing. But uh, what I believe and what I've really come to realize over the last, you know, probably 10 to 15 years is that the differences in um, body styles, ability to practice, talent levels, where golf fits into life um, really can dictate what type of golf swing we're capable of and, and what really works for us. So I think, you know, just by default to think because the best player in the world does A and B that uh, Walt, who's 72, should be doing that, I think is a little bit of a dangerous position to be in. So that's kind of our take on it. We like to evaluate the person and give them information that's more geared towards, you know, where they're at in life and from a physical ability. And then also from, you know, where golf fits in for them. Todd, in the book, you talk about the vertical line swing system. Talk about what that is. Yeah. So basically the vertical line swing system has, you know, really kind of a couple of different components. One is, is that in a nutshell, we believe that the arms take the club back and up. So the primary um, purpose of the arms is to take the club backwards and upwards, you know, along with some around, but, but for the most part, back and up and that the pivot or the body turn takes the club around. So in its most simple form, the golf swing is the arms take the club up and the body or the pivot takes the club around. And when we combine those two together, then we get the up and the around that we need in a, in a good golf swing. So that's kind of the first concept. The second concept is um, we believe that, you know, more hip turn and the release of the trail leg allows for more natural rotation. So the more the hips turn, the more the shoulders can turn, which means we can get some length to our swing. And for a lot of people as they age, or we call experienced golfers, um, they don't become more flexible. Generally, as, as we age, they become less flexible. So the ability to turn the hips which allows us to turn the shoulders, allows us to get some length to the swing without restricting a lot of movement. And we just feel like it's a, it's a better move for, you know, not just uh, experienced or older golfers, but really kind of all golfers. And I think when you look at some of the golf swings that have lasted for decades, uh, Tom Watson, you know, Jack Nicklaus, Johnny Miller, uh, these types of moves, you see those characteristics. You see arms taking the club more back and up or more vertical and you see more hip turn and a release of the trail leg for, for a, a larger and deeper pivot. Todd, one of the shots that many of us think we have, but we really don't have, is a soft flop shot. And the reason we don't have it is, A, we don't practice it much, and then when we need to use it, like when, if we have to go over a bunker or maybe over a pond, we get nervous, we swing too hard, and the next thing you know, we've either chunked it into that hazard or we've bladed it across the green, or B, we just don't have the confidence at all to hit that shot. What can we do 
to make ourselves become more confident to play that shot better? Well, um, well, number one is you got to get the right club in your hands. Uh, I mean, of course, you got to have a club that has a lot of loft on it. So if you want to hit a flop shot, you better have, you know, 56 or 58 or maybe even a 60 degree uh, lofted wedge in your bag. That's the, the first thing that's going to make it uh, easier. Um, from a, a technique standpoint, a couple things. One is I would make sure that the ball is more in the middle of the stance versus back in the stance. I think it's when the ball is a little bit more in the middle, it allows us to get the ball up a little bit higher. So that from a setup standpoint, I would make sure that the ball is more in the center of the of the stance. Um, I would also make sure that uh, you've got you know the vast majority of your weight, let's say maybe 65, uh, 70 percent of it on the lead foot. And that most importantly, through the motion, through the motion, the weight stays on that lead foot. And if anything actually increases. So if you start with, uh, let's say, Chris, 65 percent of the weight on your lead foot at address, maybe at impact, it might be 70 percent. And on the finish, it's maybe 75 or 80 percent, uh, because one of the big misconceptions or misunderstandings in chipping is that, well, quite frankly, in all shots in golf, like where the weight is at on your feet, the pressure on your feet has a huge impact on where the club hits the ground. And when we're trying to hit a high soft shot, the feeling is I need to get underneath it or under the ball or lift it. And that causes us to bottom out behind it. So in a nutshell, make sure you got a club in your bag, 56, 58, 60 degrees of loft, get the ball in the center of your stance, get your weight forward and keep it forward. And that'll improve your contact. And with that ad added loft on the club, you should be able to, to hit that shot. Speaking of having the right club, I've got to imagine, Todd, that you've tested a million different clubs over the course of your career. Have you come across a club that maybe it's not the brand name that we're all so familiar with, but that mid handicappers or high handicappers really should have this club in their bag versus something else? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a couple of ones. I mean, obviously we've, we've designed some of our own clubs, the max verts, the drivers and the hybrids. And, and uh, we've, we've got a putter that's just coming out. And so, I mean, of course, yeah, take that with a grain of salt. I'm kind of a bias because we have a, a personal interest in those, but I do think that they're, they're good, solid clubs. But I think in general, Chris, I mean, a hybrid, I, I mean, almost every golfer, I mean, even tour pros have hybrids in their bag. And so I, I think almost every golfer should have at least one, if not a couple hybrids in their bag, uh, because those clubs, they're, they're just easier to hit than a three iron or a four iron or even a five iron. And so um, I would say, you know, from a, a style of golf club, uh, a hybrid would be something that you should uh, that you should definitely, definitely look at. And taking that a step further, Todd, when the new student comes to you, maybe they're a beginner student or maybe just an intermediate student, what percentage of them just they, they bring in clubs that they bought off the rack and aren't fitted for them? And really part of the problem is the clubs just aren't right. Yeah, a hundred a hundred percent. It goes a little bit like what we we're talking about with, you know, the, the different styles of coaching. Not all information is good information for every particular individual. It's what makes the information relevant and uh, good for that student is what the student in front of you is capable of, of doing. And the same way with the equipment, um, you know, if somebody comes in with a nine degree locked a driver and a really long shaft that's super stiff and, you know, the, their club hit their driver speeds, you know, 92, 93 miles an hour, they're just not going to be able to, to hit it. And so, you know, there's no question that getting the right equipment in your hands is, is vital. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of money on golf. I mean, green fees are expensive. Golf balls are expensive. Shoes, uh, memberships to country clubs and municipal courses. And so, you know, to spend some money to get fit for a good set of golf clubs that quite honestly will last you four, five, six years. Um, if you buy a good quality set is, a, is an investment well made and will, and will help your game out. You recently wrote an article about your top five driver tips for senior golfers. For those of us that are North of 50, what's one or two tips that you can give us tonight that can help us play better? Yeah, so I would say this. I would say num number one is uh, make sure you get the golf ball teed up. I think uh, in general, amateur golfers, uh, gen golfers in general, uh, they tee their driver too low. I would make sure that they tee it up. I'd make sure that the ball is definitely forward in the stance, you know, kind of off the lead heel. I think those couple of things will promote a motion that's a little bit more uh, upward, which is good for creating a distance. And then I think the other thing is, um, you know, making sure that your backswing, you know, has some speed to it. Um, we just did a, we did a, 
a live session today, a video session on what we call it the counter backswing sequence. But in essence, you know, a lot of us are told that the backswing should be kind of long and slow. And I think for some golfers, obviously that works. I mean, you see some of that even on the PGA and LPGA tours, and it does work. But I think for golfers, as you said, north of 50 or 40, you know, they want more speed. And so get the club moving, get it going early, get some speed early in the swing and the backswing, and that will help you in the downswing. I would say the last tip would be, I really like my students to, you know, kind of hover the driver behind the golf ball. Uh, you know, I know, you know, if you watch videos of Jack Nicklaus and Greg Norman, you know, a couple of the best Tiger Woods, the best drivers of the game, you'll notice if you look closely that they kind of hover the driver just ever so slightly off the ground. And I think that kind of sets the tone of bearing the weight of the club it can really help the takeaway. So get the ball forward, make sure to tee it up nice and high, uh, hover the club a little bit. And, you know, don't be afraid to, to put some speed to the backswing. And I think that will help the transition to make your downswing even a little bit better. Todd, one of the drills that I love that you show us in your book is the, the T drill that shows us where we should be at the top of our backswings. Talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for asking that. That, that was actually a drill. I, I, uh, I came up with when I was working uh, with, with one of the gals on the LPGA who I worked with for years. And, and one of the things that uh, we worked on a lot or struggled with, and this is a case for a lot of golfers is the position at the top, the, the angle of the wrist at the top. And generally speaking, my, my coaching philosophy is, is to keep the game as simple as possible. Uh, it is a very hard game. And when we complicate it with scientific terms, although they're important to understand as an instructor, but from a student standpoint, we, we kind of want to dumb it down as much as possible and make it as easy to understand as possible. So by simply taking the T and we place the T, so, you know, the T, uh, uh, your golf club has Velcro on it. So we kind of position the T in a little opening there. So basically the as you, as you have your glove on, the T is basically pointed away from your knuckles. It's pointed up, you know. And so when you get the club to the, uh, the arms and the club to the top of the backswing, you want that T pointing more towards the sky. So what it does is it just creates some awareness of the club face at the top and how the club face position can be drastically impacted by the movement of your lead wrist. And um, it worked well for her and it's worked well for a lot of my students. For most of us, Todd, who have been playing the game for a long time, when things start to not go well, we start to think we're never going to get this thing back to where it should be. We're never going to get this right. Why is the fix actually easier than what we think it is? Yeah, I think that what I would what I would tell people is, is that no matter what level of player they are and wherever they're at in their journey of playing golf, everybody feels that way at some point. I mean, I, I've been around... Uh, players who've been fortunate enough to win major championships. And, and I've been on the driving range where I know they felt like that. I, I've seen it with, you know, uh, college players and high school players and recreation players. And so that would be the first thing that I would say is, is that if you play the game long enough, at some point, you're going to, you're going to feel like that. Um, but it's those moments, quite honestly, where most of the learning takes place. It's kind of those struggles and really reflecting on, okay, what's, what's really happening, what's going on. And so, um, you know, I think really, as you can kind of tell, my feeling is, is that, you know, we're all kind of on this journey together and part of a, the role of a good instructor is to kind of guide that journey and bring things forward. But ultimately we as individuals kind of have to own it and understand what is it that ticks for me. And so when you're in those moments where you feel just kind of lost, you know, just take a moment Try not to be emotional about it and just reflect on, okay, what, what am I feeling and what's going on and what, what were maybe some things that I was doing when I was playing well? And uh, that can kind of help us, you know, hopefully get back on track. One of the other issues you talk about in the book is called the sway. And that's my problem, keeping my hips from swaying forward versus turning in my downswing. Talk about weight distribution, that setup, and how we can keep ourselves from swaying out of position. Yeah, this is a great question. This is probably, uh, Chris, one of the most common ones that we get because I'm a big believer in the setup of, of what we call the 60-40 split. And, and those are just round numbers. But basically what, what we believe is in, you know, in the VLS system, um, we talk about in the bad lie, the book, is that when you set up, you should have a little bit more weight on your lead foot than you do on your trail foot. 
Uh, so we say 60% on the lead and 40% on the trail. And we start with a little bit more on the lead because it's almost kind of like a trigger. And so by more weight on the lead foot, I can, I can move that weight from the lead foot to the trail foot very early in the backswing. And the percentages can kind of vary based on your style of swing and things like that. But generally speaking, by the time you're halfway into your backswing, you probably will have 70 or 80% of, of your weight on your trail foot at that moment. So you've kind of almost reversed it. You started with 60 on the front and then very early in the backswing, now you've got 60, 70, 80% depend upon the club and on your trail foot. And that movement of pressure, you know, that movement of weight is, is one of the ways we create speed and, and, and power. Now, when we do that, the key there is, is that you want that weight or that pressure, shall we call it, to stay on the inside of the foot, on the inside of the trail foot. And if you do that, then it's, it's a good load or a pivot. It's not a sway. When the, when the weight goes to the outside of the foot, okay, that's when we get into like a sway and we can get into some real problems. Now, I would say this, um, in my experience, I'm not a physician, I'm not a physical therapist, but in my experience, most golfers, when they release the trail leg a little bit, release the trail knee a little bit, um, they tend to make that move much easier. But when they restrict that movement, when they keep their trail knee really flexed or they don't pivot and turn their hips, that's when they tend to sway because they just don't have the flexibility to kind of complete that backswing. It's interesting all the all the things you've talked about so far, Todd, because what I've always been told in, in, in my past is that in the backswing, we are loading the weight into our trail leg and as we start to transition, then we move the weight forward into our lead leg. But that sounds very different from what you're saying, because 60, 40 or some amount thereabouts should already be in our lead leg even before we get you know, into the downswing. So that's, that's a very different approach, because now I'm not transitioning weight from my back leg to my front leg. The majority of it's already there. Yeah, well, yeah, so just kind of for clarification, so we start with more on the lead foot, and then early in the backswing, yes, that goes towards the, you know, so it starts lead, and it definitely goes trail, you know, so if I'm a right-handed golfer, I start with more weight on my left foot, and then in the backswing, I'm definitely increasing weight onto my right foot or my trail foot, yeah, 100%, but then very early in the downswing, then that weight's, you know, certainly going forward again, so I think what people need to to not be afraid of is is moving weight from one foot to the other foot I, I mean i you know i think it's an important concept to help them create club head speed the key is just making sure as they do that that it's moving to the proper place of the foot which on the backswing is definitely on the inside of the foot versus the outside todd thinking about your career and an instruction that you've been given over the course of your career what's the best tip someone gave you early on um, gosh, you know, I've been really fortunate. I mean, I've, I've gotten, um, a lot of really good advice, like all of us have. I mean, I think of, uh, simple things like, uh, my old college golf coach, Herb Wimberly, who unfortunately, uh, passed away here, you know, recently. Um, I remember <laughs> walking off the, uh, the golf course and like most golfers, you know, we're, uh, we have good day or bad day, but we tend to kind of focus on the negative and, and things that didn't go well. And I remember him, he would always say to us, you know, tell me something good first. Just, just give me something good. And then we can talk about what didn't go well today, but Todd, but let's talk about, give me something good first. And I just, I always remembered that because um, he wanted to make sure he pulled out something positive out of us out of the round. And so that I thought was, uh, was wonderful advice. I think of my first college golf coach, uh, Dwayne Knight uh, at UNLV um, and how he really emphasized the value of, of every stroke, like one, how one stroke could help the team, you know, literally win a, a championship and, you know, whether it be the first hole or the last hole to make sure, you know, you, you're giving your best effort fighting and scratching for every, every, uh, every stroke and every shot out there. And so I think, you know, the, the world is full of great golf instructors and great advice, and we like our stuff. And you've had a, a wonderful list of guests on here, and it's an honor to be to be with you and, and be part of the group here. Um, but I think if people want to get better at golf, um, it's also not just about the golf swing. It's not just about the technique. It's about simple things like Coach Wimberly just told me or Coach Knight told me that can really move us, you know, to the next level. Todd, before I let you go, remind our listeners how they can get a copy of your book, 
watch your video lessons and then follow you online and on social media as well. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, you can find the book. It's called The Bad Lie. The easiest way is just go to Amazon and search, you know, The Bad Lie Golf Book, and you'll you'll find that. Um, we got all of our YouTube content is on uh, U.S. Golf TV. That's the best place uh, to find us there. Um, obviously, we have all of our stuff there. If you're, you know, in-person lessons, you know, you can you can go to my website at toddcobegolf.com and I can get you hooked up with, with our great staff at Sanford sports and all the different things. So we've got a lot of, uh, uh, we feel like hopefully good information out there and, you know, we're just honored to be part of people's journey and, you know, hopefully just sharing what we've learned and hopefully it helps them play a little bit better golf too. Todd, you're fantastic. My friend, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of the show this week. I hope we get the privilege of staying in touch and having you back on the show again soon. Well, I hope so. I appreciate, uh, appreciate Chris. And like I said earlier, it's an honor to be part of the, the, I saw the list of people you had uh, here. So it's, it's pretty, pretty impressive. And I'm, I'm just grateful to be part of it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, Todd. Stay safe, my friend. All the best you and your family. We'll catch up soon. All right. Thank you, Chris. Take care, Todd. Folks, that is the great Todd Kolb. K-O-L-B is the spelling of his last name. At ToddKolbGolf.com is the website. And then you can find him out on U.S. Golf TV and the great things that he is doing there as well and get a lot of really good golf swing content. And again, be sure to go out and check out the book. Uh, I've got a copy myself and I have read it and it has certainly made a difference in my golf swing. So it's called The Bad Lie, Why Traditional Golf Instruction is Failing You and What to Do Instead. And as Todd mentioned, you can find it out there on Amazon. So he's fantastic. And I hope we get the uh, the opportunity to have him uh, back on the show again uh, before too long. All right, my friends, it is time to put a bow on this edition of Next on the Team. My sincere thanks again to John Mascari, Scott McCarron, Rick Fair, and Todd Cole for being a part of the show this week. Scheduled to join me next week are, of course, our resident director of instruction, Tom Patry. He'll be back. Former PGA Tour pro John Inman will make his next on the tee debut, as will another former PGA Tour pro, Barry Cheeseman, will be here. And then we're going to round it out with Robert Morris University head men's golf coach Stephen Shingledecker. 